here this morning. Looking forward to camp meeting this week. What we all want to do in every service uh, this week in camp meeting. It's good to have one of our camp meeting speakers with us today. Brother Eddie has come over early to do our past appreciation. So good to see him. And very rarely we get to see Sister Kim. And good to see her with him today as well. And uh, Brother Elijah came. I asked him what he was doing here. And he said, you told me to come. Brother Elijah's <laughs> helping me use it today. But I'm glad to see him this morning. I'm thankful for him. And uh, looking forward to his ministry this week. And Brother Elijah will also be preaching for us next Sunday morning and Sunday night. So we're always glad to have Brother Elijah with us. He's a wonderful young man. And uh, my dad's been keeping him busy lately, I think, with his music for his revival. And, uh, just had revival at the uh, Baylor Church of God. So we're, we're excited that he is able to be with us for camp meeting. I believe this is his fourth year with us for camp meeting. I think the only one that we haven't had him do music for the first year. And, uh, we still used him a little bit last year when that broke the foot. But uh, he's still helping us out. So we're glad to have him with us today. Good to see each of you here today. As I said, today is uh, Pastor Appreciation. And, uh, we're humbled by that. I was thinking about that this morning. When I was pastoring in Broken Bow, there was a, a man sitting back uh, just probably beyond where Brother George is at this morning. And I was sitting, uh, I think I was sitting on the platform. I may have been sitting on the front row. And I heard him what he thought was a whisper, but he was 87 years old, so his whisper was very clear for everyone to hear. And he said, I'm glad this is only once a year. And if I could have yelled out an amen to him, I would have. And, but it's, it's humbling, and we're, we're thankful and grateful for all of those in preparing for today. I know a lot of work has gone in to, to honor my family and me today and uh, have for the last several years. We, should, we so appreciate that, everything that y'all put in. Uh, to not this this weekend, but this whole month, and we're grateful to you for that. And uh, we're, we're humbled by that. We just got an honor to be here as pastor and to serve you. We've got a lot coming up, a lot going on. Uh, so we want to make sure that you get a bulletin, look at the church Facebook page, and keep up with events coming up. We are right, right in the middle of the campaign for harvest uh, month for October and November. Our goal is to uh, average 75 on Sunday morning throughout the, throughout the month of October and throughout the month of November. So you can pray, invite, uh, offer rides to people to church and do all of those things uh, to help us meet that goal. That is our goal for the harvest months of October and November, of course. We want to hold that number and continue on as we, we go forward. And that's really an attainable number because if everybody would come to church at the same time, we'd be well over 80. So it's an attainable goal, and we want to meet that goal. So we've got that going on. Uh, we've got Fall Festival coming up November 2nd. Uh, and see Sister Amanda. Uh, we're going to do the same as we did last year, that each person will do a booth. And uh, it's going to be a Western theme, theme this year. Uh, so they're wanted by God, Wild West Roundup. And that'll be from 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, so see Sister Amanda today or very soon. If you would like to do a booth, we need you to do one. It helps take a lot of pressure off them. We did that last year. It worked out real well. We had our sports theme last year. So Western theme this year. Uh, Democrats would go crazy with the blazing guns, but we've got them anyway. And so we're going to enjoy our Western theme for our fall fest. So get with her. Um, I've already claimed my booth, so we're looking forward to a fall festival this year. There will be a box that she's going to put out tomorrow morning, starting tomorrow morning, uh, throughout uh, camp meeting this week and leading up to fall festival. Bring candy in uh, for fall festival. So that's not a candy box for you to reach in and get your candy when you come in for service, but we're raising that for fall festival. So if you'll fill that box up with those items that you're doing today, it's an honor to us. It's awkward for us, but it's an honor for us. We appreciate it so much. Need my crew on the front row, let's say. So this year for Pastor's Appreciation, we took a little bit of a different approach. Um, in the years past, we've kind of had a theme. But this year we thought it would be fun for you guys to see how um, people view you through the eyes of different people. So I got a group of 11 different groups. Children's Church, Teens. Um, <laughs> some of the uh, different families and music department. And they have all created a different... Um, table for you guys over in the fellowship hall. So I would like for everyone to let them go in first so that you guys can see those different creations. 
and uh, we went with, they were supposed to decorate something that either reminded them of you or something they thought about when they see you. So just take a minute to meander those, uh, those tables and see um, what everybody collectively kind of came up with. It was a fun group effort there we had. So I wanted to share, I wasn't going to go this route, but it was just kind of weighing on my heart. I wanted to share an experience I had on the job this week with you guys, and uh, then I'm going to kind of go into how it ties into you. Um, I had a young lady that I've poured a lot into over the last two years, a lot of support, trying to help her grow and minister, you know, kind of just get her to be a better person. Uh, going as far as to even create a new job position for her because I felt it would better suit her personality. Um, I thought we had a good thing going there. Um, I called her into the office to question her about a situation with a patient, which is a pretty simple routine procedure. But before the meeting was over, she really let me know. Like, both barrels. <laughs> I'm a horrible manager. I'm a liar. My whole team hates me. Everyone's looking for a new job. Um, not true, of course, but it hurts. After she was done, I asked exactly what I did that was so horrible. Uh, because if it was something I really did, I needed to apologize, and I need to make that right. And I most certainly would have done that. Her complaint? My text messages were abrupt and sometimes harsh. Well, you know, text messages are meant to be short speed. <laughs> um, so I guess at the end of the day, so, or at the end of every text, I'm supposed to say, have a fabulous day. You just see you next week, have a fabulous day. A little unrealistic. I did apologize to her and I said, you know, you have no idea what I'm dealing with. I said, you have no idea that when you text me to ask me if you can go on the computer to do some training and I give you a thumbs up sign, that I'm manning three different phones, I'm answering at least 200 emails, I have 115 patient and 25 staff members to worry about. Not to mention that three, three months ago, my whole world was turned upside down and I'm still recovering from that. Trying to help my senior figure out his path after graduation, which is a little challenging considering he has more obstacles than, up, than your average kid. Working on figuring out the baby's medical conditions and system Q died that morning. So I apologize that my text messages are too abrupt and I'll make a mental note to give you more words of encouragement and try to make you happy, make that happen. And at this point she said to me, I had no idea. I said, of course you don't. Because no one ever asked what the top of the pack's going through. No one ever thinks that maybe the leader's bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders as he tries desperately to help you in any way he possibly can. The team members of the congregation only see that this guy is maybe just doing his job. And I can assure you that your leader is doing more than a job. He is more on his plate than any of us even begin to imagine because he bears these burdens alone. When I came to him three months ago, crying and completely broken, he listened. They offered encouragement. They prayed for me and they continue to pray with me regarding this situation. He didn't share my burden with Tyler or Sister Patsy, he took it upon himself. And when you came to him with your burdens and your problems, he took that upon himself. And he took your problems and your burdens upon himself. And he takes and he takes and he takes. And then he takes it all to the throne room of God. He goes before the king, standing in the gap for you and for me. He never complains. Yeah. He doesn't grumble. He just gives us his all. Some would say it's because it's his job. And sure, pastoring is a job. But the love and dedication he feels toward us is not a job. The love that Amy and the kids give us is not a job. That's genuine love for our people. He truly has our best interests in heart. Appreciate you, Pastor. Appreciate that we don't know what he's going through, yet he still gives us his time. 
Appreciate that at times he's leaving his family at games to stand by us at the bedside of our loved ones. Appreciate that he sometimes walks away from his dinner table to talk to us on the phone because we're in crisis. Appreciate that he misses his gym time, which he needs to manage all this stress and to stay healthy to keep working for the kingdom. He misses that gym time to do appointments, to take us to appointments. He's taken our congregation when they have no way. He's picked up our kids when the families are in crisis and there's no one to pick up the kid. There's not much that our pastor wouldn't do for us. He wants better for us than some of us want for ourselves. Appreciate that he spends hours praying and seeking God to bring us messages meant to empower us and grow us spiritually so we can march alongside him in our calling to Christ. Appreciate that he has set up camp meeting with these awesome men of God to rejuvenate and lift us and restore us. Cut him a little slack if you ever feel like he isn't getting it just right. Because I promise you, he's given it his all. Love and pray for your pastor. And Sister Amy, I want to thank you for your behind-the-scenes stuff. I know you're not up here on the stage, but there's a lot you do that you don't get credit for. The things no one notices or appreciates but should, y'all have toilet paper because of her. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Also, organizing and, ex and execute, executing the majority of our functions at the church, you provide godly counsel for the women that need it. And most importantly, thank you for your flexibility. I know that's a hard thing to have. But your flexibility in life, as you never know what your day is going to, starts one way and ends another. And I know that that's difficult. Thank you that you fill in where Brother Jamie is gone and that you do it without grumbling or complaining. Thank you for being his other half. For making this work. We love and appreciate you too. No one crazy. I'm proud of you. Watching you grow up physically and spiritually is one of my biggest rewards. Keep seeking the Lord in all that you do. Your dad has one of the most important jobs around, and he needs your love and support. Yeah. And you should be proud to call him your dad. Wyatt family, I can't thank you enough on behalf of Middlebrook Church of God for your love and dedication to our church and its members. You are all a blessing to us, and I hope that each of you recognize your importance. We love you all.
it's an honor, it's a privilege to do that. We're thankful to the Lord for that. So we're going to shift the order of the service this morning. Appreciate so much, Sister Man, for heading that up. We're looking forward to seeing what is waiting for us over there. All of the ideas that's been put into that. Uh, what an exciting time. And uh, last year, they they took my office. It took me to about July to get all the balloons out of my office. But, uh, whatever's in store, we so appreciate it. We're, we're thankful today. Brother Elijah's going to come at this time, sing us a special, and immediately follow Brother Elijah. Brother Eddie's going to come and share the Word of God that the Lord has placed on his heart. <laughs>
grace and for his loving kindness and mercy. Appreciate you, Brother Elijah. Appreciate what you do for the work of the Lord. October has been designated as Pastor Appreciation Month. And uh, last year, a camp meeting, I tried my best, each pastor that came through a camp meeting to honor them and to recognize them. And I never do that again this year. This year we've got uh, Brother Eddie Sullivan with us, by the way, Assembly of God in Foley, Alabama, doing a wonderful work there. Uh, planted, started that church. And uh, just, I know a lot of work has gone into that over the years. A lot of tweaks and adjustments that, that go into pastoring. I'm not sure how long Brother Eddie's been there, I believe 15 plus years, if I'm not mistaken, 17 years he's been there. He does that. He's a camp meeting speaker and evangelist. I don't know how he how he juggles all of that, but he does, and he does it effectively, and he does it wonderfully. And uh, we, we see him quite often, because any time he's in the area, we try to get there, because I love to hear him preach. He's always been one of my favorite preachers. But uh, we don't get the opportunity to see his wife as much because, just as Sister Amanda said about Amy, they're usually back home taking up all of our slack and taking up those things that we have to leave behind and those things that, uh, that need to be taken care of around the hall. And uh, so we're grateful. We're honored to have Sister Sullivan with us this week along with Brother Eddie. And just looking forward to having him in our day services preaching this week. And I just honor him uh, this morning. As I said, he's one of the men that I look up to in pastoral ministry. And it's a great honor for him to accept the invitation to come and preach our pastor appreciation today. Come on, Brother Eddie. Just obey the Lord today. Let God have his way in our hearts and our lives. Whatever the word of the Lord has for you today, receive it with gladness. Amen. Lord, what an honor it is to be with you on this Sunday morning for pastor appreciation as you honor your pastor. You know the Bible said that he's worthy of double honor. The Bible says that I did. Not only does he uh, fight for his own family, for his own soul, to live an, an exemplary uh, life, a life that uh, promotes a godly example for you to follow. <coughs> Under the attack of hell, just for being a man of God, but then, like Sister Amanda said, he stands in the gap and makes up the hedge for all of you and shoulders the burden by taking them to the throne. And you know, whether it's a uh, a cartoon character or one of the old western movies where people get shot three or four times and barely draw a lamp and just keep going. <laughs> Pastors aren't invincible. They aren't superheroes. They bleed. They hurt. They worry. They get frustrated. They fight off anguish and sometimes oppression or depression, whatever you want to call it. I know people would think that if a pastor got depressed, he must not be he must not be a praying man or he must not be very faithful to his calling. Well, I didn't tell you they stay depressed, but I can tell you they fight it off. The only way I know to find an office is to stay in the altar. But uh, they put on a smile when they want to throw their sucker in the dirt and go home. They're faithful when other people don't see a need to be. They lead when everybody else is content to follow. They give even when they don't have it to give. And on and on and on I could go with why a pastor should receive double honor. And I want to thank you and I want to commend you for honoring the pastor. Not only today, but this month. And not only he, but his wife and his children. It's difficult being in a pastor's home for a wife. Because her life, she lives in a glass house. She don't get to hurt and cry. She don't get to gripe and grumble and complain. 
She doesn't get to hide in the background. She doesn't get to stay home when she doesn't feel like it. She doesn't get to do all of it. She doesn't get the opportunity or the choice of not being faithful. Not going, not supporting, not caring. No, she, she serves right along by her side. The children live in that same glass house. They don't get to do any of those things either because their dad is the pastor. And do you know that when somebody gets mad at the pastor, they get mad at them just because they're guilty of being in the pastor's family. And they get mad at the mindset of what did I do? What did I do wrong? Why are you angry at me? Sometimes they don't even know why somebody's upset with them because they don't know somebody's upset with Brother Jamie. And they just get the brunt of it just because. It's, I'm just telling you, it's difficult being in the pastor's home. I've seen all of that, and uh, when people stop and take time to encourage you, to thank you, to support you, or to embrace you, it sure does make it feel worth everything else that you go through. So, those harvest months this month in November, support the vision of your pastor. One of the things I have always loved about Brother Jamie, I've watched him grow as a minister, not that I'm mean anything more than he is, maybe just been pastoring a little bit longer. Uh, but one thing I appreciate your, about your pastor is he's a visionary. I've always noticed that about him. He's always casting the vision that God places in his heart for you and for your church. Without a vision, the people perish. As a visionary, he's given you the projected goal, the end line, where God desires for you to be. I'm thankful for that. He's inspired me by being a visionary. Uh, he mentioned Brother Odom. Brother Odom inspires me to do better administratively. He has got his act together. And uh, every time I get around him, I say, so you can do better. You can be better. And I feel the same way when I get uh, around Brother Jacob. He inspires me to be better. And so I know he inspires you to be better. No, and that's what I love no, about him and I appreciate about him. Yes, Amen. What an honor to be here with you this week. And uh, the message, if he's like me, and he may not be. <laughs> but whenever we have a pastor appreciation, they, they usually run by me who they would like to get or who they'd ask to kind of get my nod of approval and I always wanted to get somebody that's going to come and just preach. I get up and give a motivational speech about me or tell everybody about how great I am. I just want them to preach. And if we can have church, have a good altar service, it's the best pastor appreciation day in the whole world for me. <laughs> And so today's message is not going to be about Brother Jamie and about the office or the title of the pastor or pastoral ministry. Though I did come to honor him today, I more so come to help him, to get in the yoke with him and to preach to you and to desire to see you get in this altar and let God touch you and help you. And I promise you he'll go home feeling Wonderful if you get in and let God do a work in your life. If he sees one of you saved, one of you healed, one of you baptized in the Holy Ghost, there are no greater gifts of ministry than that. I want to read to you this morning out of the book of Matthew, chapter number 13. Brother Elias of being with us this morning. I got to <laughs> What are you doing here? You told me to be here. Oh. <laughs> sounds just like Brother Elias. <laughs> Matthew.
Matthew chapter 13, we'll begin reading with verse number 3. He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some seed, or some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, for when they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And they look down. The Lord gives us the explanation of this parable, beginning in verse number 18. He said, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, he becometh unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I want to title the message this morning, preach on this thought, the tragedy of wasted seed. The tragedy of wasted seed. Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask you in this service this morning, Lord, even on a pastor appreciation Sunday, God, in the kickoff service for camp meetings, we pray that you would do mighty things in our midst this morning. Give us ears to hear. You said even in our text, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. God, give me ears to hear this morning what the Spirit of God would speak unto the church. I pray, O oh God, you would draw us, each and every one of us, around this altar this morning. You do an everlasting work in our heart. There's one here that needs to be saved. You are the Savior this morning. God, there's one here, and I know there is, who's battling sickness or infirmity in their body. I pray today your manifest healing would be present in this house to heal those that need healing in their body. I pray, oh God, you'd pour out of your spirit upon all flesh. You would baptize us every one anew and afresh in the Holy Ghost and power. Grant it, we pray. God, we give you thanks for what you're going to do, not only today, but throughout this week. We ask it all in Jesus' name. If you love the Lord, would you say amen? Amen. amen. You may be seated. Clearly, we're made to understand in this parable that the seed is the Word of God. I mean, the Lord makes that very clear. With each parcel of ground, He said, with the seed that fell on the wayside are those that heard the Word. The seed that fell into the stony ground were they that heard the word. So he tells us very clearly that the seed represents his word. That's why in this text I noticed as I read it that three quarters of the seed that was sown went to waste. And as I read that and pondered on it, meditated on that for a while, tears began to well up in my eyes and my heart began to be very pained as I thought about what if three quarters, 75% of everything that I've ever preached went to waste. Come on. What if 75% of all the messages that I prayed and fasted and studied for and delivered from behind a pulpit or in a nursing home or in a jail cell or 
wherever God, in a rehab facility, wherever God's allowed me to preach through the years, what if 75% of those messages were all for nothing? She just went to waste. I, you know, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. And then I thought about, that's me thinking as a preacher. But do you know, before I was a preacher, I was just a Christian. I believe a preacher always be saved. Yeah. I don't think all of them are, but I, I think that's a good qualification. Yeah. If a man's going to preach the gospel, he ought to be saved. And I thought about before I was a, ever a preaching man, I was a Christian man, and I thought about all the messages that I ever heard preached from my pastors, from lay preachers in the church, from evangelists that came through. All the messages I heard. And then I thought, did I let those messages go to waste? Right. Messages that were wept over, sought out through prayer, received through times of fasting and self-sacrifice. Did those messages just bounce off of me? Or did they find their rightful place? Think about this. The Word of God is quick. And that word means alive or living. You know, when you look at the seed, we've all get this idea in our mind, whatever seed you see most often, a watermelon seed, an orange seed, an apple seed, what a grape seed. You, you look at that, you take that seed in your hand and you look at it, what you see is just the old outer shell, husk, if you will. A kernel, the Bible calls a corn, except the corn of wheat or a seed of wheat falls into the ground and dies and abides alone. What we see is just the exterior shell that we call the seed. What you don't see is inside that seed there is life. It just looks like an old shell, a husk. Many of the seeds look shriveled. They're not very pretty or pleasurable to look at. But you don't see the life on the inside of that seed. Something is actively living and wanting to break forth and wanting to grow and wanting to be productive. It's wanting to feed somebody else. You gotta do something with that life that is in your hand if you ever expect to see that life manifest and brought forth, you've got to give it a chance to show you what it was intended to bring forth. Or else the seed just goes to waste. You think about the number of seed just in our life that are discarded, thrown away. Those things are alive and put in the right hand. They have the ability to feed the whole world. That's why it's so tragic when the seed in our text is wasted because the Word of God is alive. The Word of God has living power to bring forth and produce life that put in the right heart could save the whole world. Put in the right heart can transform a home forever. Put in the right heart can change the course of somebody's eternal destiny and the lives of all those that are around them. Jesus said this. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. That's right. I mean, the word of God, your Bible, is life. It's life-giving transformative power at your fingertips and at your hearing. It's not like riding down the road, you know, just tapping your foot to a song. We kind of get entertained by a song, even Christian songs. A lot of us just listen for listening pleasure, for entertainment. I'm going to tell you, 
the Bible's not just for listening pleasure. Right. 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 It's not for entertainment. It's not to make you tap your toe or to clap your hand. This book is to produce the life of God on the inside of you. And that it would break forth like a seed from the ground. For all the world to see Jesus is living in your heart and in your life. And that that same Jesus that's able to save, heal, deliver, set free, baptize with the Holy Ghost would do just that through your life. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. He likened his word unto a solid rock, a sure foundation upon which we can build. His word healed the sick and raised the dead. His word delivered those that were possessed by the devil. His word brought salvation to all who believed it. His word this morning is the difference between life and death. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference uh, for some between being healed or dying. His word is the difference uh, this morning between uh, victory and defeat, revival or ruin. Then he tells us, right in our text, why some seed produced and why some seed did not. Why some preaching or some sermons or some messages work and other ones don't. They go to waste. Oh my, come on. Man, God's laid messages on my heart before burning in my heart. I feel like, oh, let me get in that pulpit tomorrow. My coattails on fire. I've got a fresh word from God. I'm ready to preach this and turn the whole world upside down. And I preach like my coattails on fire. I preach like I'm anointed of God, almighty and full of the Holy Ghost. And it feels like as soon as they get past the pulpit, they just drop down to the floor. Everybody looks at me like a cat staring at a new gate. Like, is that supposed to be okay? Is that supposed to be exciting? Is that supposed to move me or cause me to want to shout? Is that supposed to help me or give me some victory? And I think, God, what happened? What went wrong? That went off the rails quick. You know, when you preach a revival or camp meeting, you see, what you don't see is all the prayer and the fasting that went in through that local church. What you don't see is visitors and other people that are living right and praying and hungry, promoting a, a wonderful atmosphere. What you don't see is all the prayer that went in to that meeting. The ground was ready. The preacher preached and great things happened. But if you follow myself or Brother Brian or Brother Kenny Morris or any other of the pastors that you been in a meeting where God really moved or God really helped or God really worked, you would, you would find out that a lot of times those messages bounce off the wall. All right. All right. <laughs> that a lot of times people just sit and stare at you. When's he going to get through so we can go eat? <laughs> but people say to me, Brother Jerry, I'm glad we're going to do this once a year. <laughs> We're told why some preaching is effective and some is not. There's no problem with the seed. None whatsoever. There is absolutely no problem with the Word of God. None. It still works. I'm still amused every time I go to a district function or a state function or a church, church group, something or another. And they come up with all these catches gimmicks and all these neat ways and these awesome ideas. And they throw all these statistics at us on the church is in decline, the church is in plateau, the young people are leaving the church and we need to get with the times, we need to change our tactics, we need to develop new ways or ideas, we need to understand we're living in a digital age, we need to understand people's, you know, because of they're always looking at a screen and they're always being 
you know, brief that this is a texting generation, this is a social media age. They say the average person's attention span now is two and a half minutes, and you gotta get with it to reach this generation. You gotta get with I thought, does the gospel not work anymore? I mean, does the word is the word of God of no effect anymore? Does it have no life giving power? The word, there, there's no problem with the seed. The seed is good. You read, you can read in another parable. In Matthew, the same chapter, in chapter 13, and verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. I, I, my mind went back to years ago. We've been, by the way, for 17 years and probably about 15 years ago I can remember researching and preaching a message and it was one of those messages I thought was going to be awesome and it just no I mean I, I researched and prepped and had you know a lot of stuff that I thought was good and helped me well it did help me but it just didn't go over well in my church and I preached on sowing good seed. Right. And in that study, in researching seed, it took me to information, and I found it on the internet. I think I Googled it. Monsanto Corporation. Anybody ever heard of Monsanto Corporation? They're huge, especially in agriculture. Monsanto created our nation contracted, our government contracted, Monsanto Corporation to work with our government in our nation's seed stock or our seed supply, our food supply. Monsanto took our nation's seed stock into the laboratory and developed what they determined or what they called Terminator Technology. They would alter the seed's ability to bring forth fruit. Somehow, through this terminated technology, they put in that seed the ability to only bring forth one generation or one lifespan. Meaning, that seed will put off fruit this year. But if you try to save seed stock from that fruit, and then replant out of your seed stock that you saved out of your harvest, it'll grow a pretty stock, but there will be no fruit on it, none. And if you want to try that out and test it like I did, <laughs> I tested it out on corn because we plant corn sometimes in our on our deer leaves for the deer to eat. Well, I bought corn from the feed store, we planted it, I saved seed stock, and I said the next year I'm going to see if that that I read is really true. And I planted it, I told you know the other guys that was on the lease with me what I was doing and why I was doing it. And to their shock and to my shock, we planted it and the next crop that come up, the most beautiful green corn stalks and not one ear of corn on any of them. Our government did that. Yeah. Why would they do that? So you would have to come back yeah. every year and buy seed from them. Yeah. They want to control whether you eat next year or not. And ultimately, they do. Yeah. They love playing God. They love having a little bit of power. You watch it play out every day in the national media. One side jockeying for power against the other. Somebody wanting to think they've got more power than the other. With one stroke of God's hand, they would all be in the grave tomorrow. Listen, Monsanto altered the seed and ruined its ability to be able to produce the life that God intended it to produce. And I preach, if we alter the Word of God, if we take out things that God put in it, it can't produce the way God intended it. If we add to it what God never intended, 
intended to be in it, that it will hinder the ability for that seed to produce. Listen, you let the word, just preach the word. Paul told Timothy, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. Men won't endure sound doctrine. Men will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And will be turned from the truth unto faith. He scared that young preacher to death. And what's a young preacher to do? Growing up in perilous times in a generation that don't want to hear the truth, but would rather you preach to them a non-truth or a fairy tale or a make-believe story, a make-believe Jesus, a make-believe heaven, living in a make-believe church world, in a make-believe kingdom of God, one that's full of error and not truth. What's a man to do? Preach the word. Preach the word. This gospel still works everywhere with anyone. Yes. Yes. What's the ground? <laughs> For seed to produce properly, it must have good ground. And three quarters or 75% of the ground in our text was not ready to receive the seed. Yes. Think about that. The Lord spoke to my heart during a prayer meeting. That's what this message was birthed out of. We have prayer meeting on Tuesday nights and said to me during that Tuesday night prayer meeting every individual is responsible for his or her own ground. That their ground has to be ready or the word being preached or taught will be wasted. And it's not up to me this morning. What you get from God is up to you. Genesis 2 and 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Do you hear that? You came from dust. You were made out of dirt. Genesis 3 and 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art. And unto dust thou shalt return. Jesus said, Dirt you are. <laughs> and dirt you will be again. I know we print and got ready and we looked in the mirror and we all come to the same conclusion before we left to come to church. You either came to this conclusion, man, you look good. <laughs> or you came to the conclusion that the rest of us came to is that's as good as you're going to look. You might as, well quit. <laughs> as good as it's ever going to get. Man, you stand there all day until next year. That's as good as it gets. We might as well go on to church. It don't get no better than this. This, this dirt is so worthless that you got to pay somebody 10 to 20 grand just to get rid of it when the breath leaves this body. This body's so worthless that I got to pay somebody to take it, to haul it off. <laughs> We clearly see that we're dust, we're dirt, we're earth. And the seed, God's word, is looking for a piece of ground, dirt or earth, to take root in and grow and to produce. God's word is sown with intention to find the good ground. You are God's piece of ground. You are God's parcel of earth that he's looking for this morning. This word's not supposed to bounce off the wall. It's not supposed to fall down into the carpet. This word is being sown to find your heart and to bring forth. In Jeremiah 4 and 3, we read this. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. He's not telling them to go out in the backyard and bust sod and plant you a garden. No, he's speaking about their heart. Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Hosea 10 and 12, sow to yourselves 
in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. He tells us how we break up the fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. Amen. Prayer is where you break up your ground. Right. Prayer Amen. is where you get ready to hear the word of God. Somebody said, man, that preacher really preached. He plowed me up. Well, that wasn't his intention. His preaching was supposed to be so and seen into the ground that you had already plowed up. And the reason why the seed can't find anywhere to grow is because the preacher is having to plow you. I want to talk to you about wayside seed. Seed that fell upon the wayside. That seed is the seed that sown with intention. Or the seed, all seed that sown, is sown with intention for those who will hear it, heed it, obey it, and believe it. That's a sinner or a saint. What the seed is not intended for is entertainment. The seed is not for looking or listening pleasure. The seed is sown with intention of production. God Himself said that Isaiah 55 and 10 for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater listen to this so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. God said, my word is like seed that is not supposed to return back void unto me. He said, just as snow comes down and rain comes down and waters the earth, so it is with my word. My word goes forth and it don't come back to me empty, but it's going to bud and blossom and bring forth fruit. He said, I watch over my word to perform it and I won't let my word rot in the ground. I won't let my word go to waste. I will make my word produce. And the only time the word doesn't produce is when it don't find the ground. The wayside though is not a part of the field. The wayside has no intention of producing. You know, the wayside is just the pathway where the tractor or the truck goes by. Fields over here, he's riding the pathway with the tractor to get to the field. He never does disc up the, the pathway. That's the wayside. The wayside is not a part of the field. It has no intention of producing. The wayside only can watch while the field brings forth. The wayside is for travelers. It's for passers-by. It's for onlookers and observers. Those with a wayside heart are those that never give a second thought about what is going to be preached in any service. Never was their thought to prepare their own hearts to hear the word being taught or preached. Probably didn't bring a Bible, and if they did, most likely never read it. There's been no prayer, no study, not a thought giving. Lord, what do you want to say to me today? The word just doesn't stand a chance on the wayside. Jesus said they, the wayside, the seed that fell up among the wayside, are they that hear the word, but they don't understand what they heard. They hear the preaching, and Jesus said they don't understand it. They don't understand why they should repent. They enjoy sin. They enjoy their lifestyle. Church is boring to them, but sin is fun. They don't understand worship. They don't understand praise. They don't understand shouting to victory. That's also foreign to them. They understand shouting at a ball game. They understand shouting about other things. But they don't understand shouting the victory over spiritual things. Why? The wicked one steals the word that they heard preached and is gone at the closing amen of the service. It's just gone. I've been
been in services before, great services. How church go? Went good. Had a great service. Really? Oh, yeah. Holy Ghost really moved. I'm telling you, it was powerful. You ought to have been there. Why? What did he preach on? Yeah, come on. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't really remember, but it was good. I'm telling you, it was good. Yeah. Well, what you're admitting to is I did get, I felt what they were feeling. And I got caught up emotionally in the service and it felt good. And it moved me emotionally. I didn't just sit there with my arms folded. I cried. I was moved emotionally. I was brought to tears. I raised my hand. I shouted a little bit. I took me a lap around the building. I jumped up and down. I danced a little bit. People dance in ballrooms. People jump up and down in the, in the ball stadium. They're not any more spiritual when they go home. That's right. That's right. I knew I'd get their response. They're not any more spiritual for it when they go home. Do you know the only thing that's really going to help you is the Word? That's right. That's what's going to take root in your heart. I'm going to tell you the shout's over when they, when they put the guitar down. When they leave the piano. When they put the mic back in the sand. The shout's over. We're not shouting and dancing on the way back home. That's over with. But it's the Word. It's what took root in my heart. said the seed that fell by the wayside the fowls of the air seen it. Right. Swooped down and took it away. If you've ever planted a garden, if you've ever planted a field, if you've ever farmed or sowed seed, we sow it with a hopper or either with a hand spreader. Sometimes you can sow it by hand. I like using spreaders so it didn't be evenly spread. What I, what I have to do is find out how far it's throwing the seed and get far enough from the edge of the field to start. Isn't that right? Now how you do it? Yeah. Why? So you don't waste your seed. That's right. Because all that seed you throw out into the ground that's not ready, man, doves, yeah. black birds, mocking birds, red birds, yeah. blue jays, sparrows, and every other kind of bird. Be a whole flock or a covey of them. They're all down there getting a free meal. That seed don't stand a chance. And the Lord said, ground that's not being prepared is like seed that falls by the wayside. It don't stand a chance. That as soon as the final amen is said, the devil comes down and just catches away that word. And you don't remember it. You don't understand it. It don't ever take root and grow. Stony ground seed. Some seed fell on stony ground. Two years ago, we, we went to, uh, flew into Pennsylvania. While there, we visited Philadelphia. I wanted to see Freedom Hall, where our nation was really birthed, where they framed the Constitution of the United States. Do you know it was birthed in prayer? That our government was so divided, so pitched one side against the other, and trying to frame the Constitution of how to govern our nation, we were so divided one side against the other that one of the founding fathers of our nation said, We need the Lord. We need the Lord to come and help us. We're so far apart. We need Him, we need His Spirit to come and make us one. And bring unity for the good of our nation. <coughs> History says that after holding a prayer meeting in Freedom Hall for several hours, that the wind of the Spirit blew into that room and united men who were pitched one against another 
had made them of one heart and, and allowed them to frame the work called, that we call our Constitution. And it's held our nation together for a long time. I wish to God that bunch of Washington could learn something from the history books. We are so divided and pitched one against another till it's time for the Lord to intervene. But I, I want to see that. We, we actually, I guess it's been three years now, a little over three years, it has been because Mr. Obama was president. I didn't know if anything would be left. When he got out of office and right. Hillary was to get elected, I didn't know if anything would be left. Right. I'm serious. Yeah. I thought I'm going to witness the death of my country right before my eyes. We're going to be a third world, world country before I can look up. And I told the family, let's go see it before, while there's still anything left. So we went, we visited there, we visited Gettysburg. If you've never been to Gettysburg, go. Take a vacation and go. It's worth the trip. So much history is still pretty much untouched since the days of the Civil War, the city of Gettysburg is. All those old houses and homesteads and farms have been kept pristine and original. We went out to the vast fields where the Battle of Gettysburg took place. Just large farming fields. They're still exactly the way they were during the Gettysburg War. Fields were little stone walls, still perfectly preserved since the time of the war. The tour guide that day told us that regiments of soldiers had lain behind those rocks during the battle, and he said multitudes, scores of men died right here where you're standing, behind this little wall. Using this tiny wall, it was probably from the floor to the top of the platform, just little stones. He said those stones were not placed there for the battle. They didn't build these walls for the battle. And he said, can anybody guess or tell me why these little walls were erected? Somebody raised their hand. He said, yes, sir. He said, these were farming fields. Farmers plowed those rocks out of these fields when they were breaking these fields up. Right. Every time they got a rock, they'd stack <clears> them <throat> on the outskirts of the field. Just made fences, that's how it worked. He said, that's exactly right. He said, do you come from a farm family? He said, I do. He said, we got the same thing around our fields. Right. He said, my old grandpa bust the field up, pulled stones out of the dirt, why would they do that? Because if you try to plant where the soil's full of stones, seed can't go very deep in the soil before it hits the stone. There's no room for the seed to take root. The seed that tried to grow in stony ground had no depth of earth, the Bible said. It could not get rooted, and therefore, when the sun sprung up, it scorched the plants. They didn't have any moisture of earth to fight off the heat of the sun. And they withered and they died and became unfruitful. Ephesians 3 and 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You can't be filled with the fullness of God if you never get rooted and grounded. You can't see it. You can't have it. We want our churches to be full of the Holy Ghost, but they're not willing to root up the stones out of their hearts. Colossians 2 and 6 says, You therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in it, rooted and built up in it, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Again, he uses the word abounding. 
abounding means to be fruitful, overflowing, to be about. He said, I come that you might have life and life more abundant, a fruitful life, an abounding life, a life overflowing with fullness. But again, he said, you have to be rooted. So I stood looking at those stone walls in Gettysburg, tears filled my eyes, not just for the soldiers that died in those walls, but also for the sweat and the toll it took for the owner of that field to plow all of those rocks out of that dirt, stack them up and make a wall out of them. So I was standing there thinking of our Lord's parable of the sower and the stony ground. I was reminded all too well of the labor intensity that's involved to remove the stones from the soil. Primitive plow was involved. There was no other way to get the rocks out of the ground but to dig them out. Plow them up and dig them out. And you know prayer roots out the stones from our stony heart. Ezekiel 11 and 18, and they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence, and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. He said it again in chapter 36 and verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them and ye shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God and I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the corn and I will increase it and lay no famine upon you and I will mold shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. He said as long as the stone remained, they couldn't bring forth. And it was a reproach to them. I'm going to tell you, it is the greatest reproach that you could ever imagine for a church to resort to worldly tactics to try to Turn Fox News off for a little while. Yeah, 
focus on your relationship with God and focus on your church. Amen. 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 I'm telling you, who cares? If we've got the baseball playoffs, we, we're in, we've kicked off the NFL, we're right in the heart of a college football. When that winds down, the NBA will kick off. PGA, hunting season, it's always weather to catch a bass down here. And about the same old, at, at home, to either go bass or brim fishing or go out deep sea fishing in the Gulf, there's always something to take your time. You've always got another bill to pay. You've always worked some extra hours of overtime. I'm going to tell you, your life's passing you by. Your knuckles are going to ache before you go to bed. Your back's going to hurt. Your knees are going to hurt. 
You're going to know you've been down there. You're going to know you sweat. You're going to know you worked. You're going to know it was labor intensive. You're going to feel it. I want to tell you, when you sow that seed, you don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to hope. You don't even have to beg a seed to grow when it's in good ground. You know. Just let seed be sown in good grace. It's going to do what God created it to do. God said it will not return for it. It won't just lie there dormant. Let it be placed in good ground. Let it receive rain and let it receive sunlight. We're now, I haven't planted yet on my lease this year. I haven't. That's the only planting that I do every year, so that's the only analogy I can get. I haven't planted yet. Why? Because we've been nearly two months without a drop, right. and the ground is like concrete. I just had no sense in trying to break the ground up as hard as a rock. We got to wait for some rain. But when it rains, we're going to bust that side. We're going to put a rotary tiller in it. We're going to rip out all the old farm root systems, everything. And, and over the past several years that was in our way, that's been dug up, taken out of the ground. We made that ground ready. We sowed the seed. We run a drag over it and cover it up so the valves in the air can't come. Take it away. Brother Kevin, I don't sit at home at night and say, oh man, I hope the seed comes forth. Hope the seed breaks the ground. Hope the seed don't go to waste. I don't. I don't lose a night's sleep over. I'll go back three or four days and I'll look and see little old green shoes breaking the ground. Look like frog hair coming out of the ground. I say, oh yeah. Start leaking my chops. I start counting my deer before they ever come, because I know they come. I know that seed's gonna break forth and do what it does. I know it. It's what God intended for it to do. God said, "We get this ready." That word meets with good ground. He said, "Brother Jack, you don't need to beg me for revival." You don't need to beg me for the Holy Ghost to follow. You don't need to beg me to bring forth abundance in your life. You don't need to beg me to touch you. Give my word an opportunity to do. You know the psalmist said, Psalms 107. He sent his word and healed them. Sick. No, not at all. I'm going to tell you, you don't need to beg God for your healing. You don't. You've got the Word of God. And the psalmist said that His Word is help to all of our bones. The Holy Ghost. You see that hand? There ain't nothing in it to get you well. Not one thing. It's not a magic wand. There's no magic potion in it. But what we're going to do is according to the word. We're going to anoint you with oil because that's what the word says. We're going to pray over you because that's what the word asks us to do. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Your hope is in the word. Let your heart receive God's word by faith and believe God's word. You don't need to beg him to heal you. He wants to heal you. He moves tribes for your healing. You don't have to beg for the Holy Ghost to fall. He promised that in the last days he would pour it out. Will it? Let that word find your heart. Let that come to pass in your life. 
poured out on me this morning because I've made room for you in my life for you to feel me. Feel me this morning. Heal me this morning. Save me this morning. Set me free this morning. Bring revival to my home this morning. Bring revival to our church this morning, oh God. Let your word have free course. Would you stand with me this morning? How many of you brought a plow with you this morning? No long handle hoe, a guard rake, a tiller, a disc. Well, not in the natural you did, but in the spiritual you did. You can do it. God will give you strength to do it. How many of you meet me in this altar? On pastor appreciation, you'd help Brother Jamie. Break up enough ground in this house for this to be the best camp meeting we've ever had. Hallelujah. It's up to you this morning. Every man, every woman is responsible for it. He alone is responsible. If the word finds its rightful place, takes root and brings forth. Hallelujah. Let God hear your voice this morning. Let him hear your voice. It's me, O oh God. It's me, O oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
come from. No matter where all the stats come from that they come up with, they'll tell you how many pastors entered into ministry and then leave the ministry within five years. How many churches have opened? You could, they do all of that research. All of the studies on pulpit studies. But a staggering statistic was given to us this morning by the man of God that was not out of a pulpit study, was not out of a poll, but straight out of the Word of God. Straight out of the Word of God. 75% of the Word that we hear, 75% of the Word that we preach, potentially, the tragedy key word in this sermon title to me this morning was a tragedy. A tragedy. Wasted seed. That seed is precious. That seed is wonderful. That seed is what we need. I was just sitting there this morning listening to the message. I told you before, camp meeting, before, as we've been preparing, when we enter into camp meeting this week, as I'm still pastor, but I'm sitting there and I'm receiving the word this week and I want to, to receive the word what, what God has to say to me. And so as a Christian man, felt God speaking to me saying, break up that fellow ground. That you can receive what I have to say to you without hesitation. That you can do what I say do without hesitation. Because if you haven't broken up that fellow ground in prayer, when God speaks that word to you, you're reluctant, you're resistant, you're all of those things that He covered this morning. And number two, my office, my position, my call as a preacher, as a pastor. Seems really quite simple what Paul told Timothy, Brother Eddie. Preach the Word. Sometimes we make that much more difficult than it has to be. It's already laid out right there too for us. And God said, just do what I called you to do. Preach it. Preach it with boldness. Preach it with integrity. But Paul also said this. He that preaches the gospel must live the gospel. So just preach the word. So just preach the word. That's my goal. That's my desire. That's what I'll continue to do as a preacher. Is preach the word. As a man of God, as a child of God, I'm stay in that prayer closet. Keep this ground cultivated. I've been preaching to you on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. We've been talking a lot about that, our own ground. Talked to you a few weeks ago about a farmer having to prepare his own ground where Paul wrote to the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and truth. That's not saying that the preacher, the pastor, the minister does not have any place in your relationship with God and you're growing. I'm going to say exactly what the man of God preached this morning. If we haven't prepared ourselves for the Word of God, that Word of God will not find place without us. Let's start it today. We want this camp meeting to be everything that God intends it for it to be. It has to start with this message, with this service, with this calling, with this bidding, with this opportunity to get in a prayer closet. To get in a prayer closet and fill these altars every service. Breaking up fallow ground, dealing with all of those things Digging out those stones, digging out those roots. That sounds like work, Pastor. It is. But it's worth it. It's worth it. He said, Be steadfast, unmovable, always about in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'm thankful for this opportunity that we have to work for the Lord and to desire and look for and long for. A harvest. Wonderful thing about messages like that this morning as a Christian, it feeds you as a preacher, it gives you all kinds of message thoughts, and you want to preach all of them before you close, but I won't do that. So stay in the good this morning. We'll be dismissed. Head over to the fellowship hall for a time of fellowship. We want everyone to come over, fellowship with us, spend time over the fellowship hall this afternoon for lunch. No PM service tonight, so take time this afternoon. Just enjoy a good time of fellowship, enjoy one another's company. Let's just uh, prepare ourselves, get rested up tonight. It's going to be a long week of